One, two, test one, two, audio test one, settings, audio properties, one, 100 level, level 100, settings, 100, 200, 420, 420 set, audio level set, set one, set one. Howdy doody.
Hello, one, two, one, two. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Today's lecture will be kind of chill and relaxed, again. Um, and, at, and as soon as I'm done talking, then we can go get food, so, um, because it's already here, but, you know, it would be, they told us that we can't eat in here anymore because we made too much of a mess last time. Technically, there's no eating in lecture halls, but we were doing it anyway because we thought like we'd get away with it as long as there was no mess. Um, but I guess we didn't clean up well enough, and uh, so we'll have to eat outside this time. Um, not like outdoors outside, but like in the hall, you know? Uh, so uh, the beginning of today's lecture is a very exciting announcement, which is, uh, according to James, uh, we have can you talk about how the no docker thing works? And so I will talk about how the no docker thing works. We have here the battle code scaffold. Remember, this is where we installed the battle code players. We downloaded the battle code players from here. Well, now, if you download this again with a zip download, or if you just uh, use git pull to update your version of battle code 18 scaffold, now if you get this, you don't need to use docker at all. And, uh, and I'll give a little, a little view of what that would look like. I've got it already running here, so let me just stop the manager here uh, and, and give a little indicator of what that would be like. Sometimes if you click stop manager here, yeah, so you can see I stopped the manager and, uh, and this is the Docker manager here. So what I've, what I've done and what you can do is you can simply go to the Battlecode scaffold master directory. Um, it, for me, because I used a version of this that was generated like an hour ago, it's called battlecode scaffold dash no docker, but yours won't say dash no docker. You can go here on Windows and you can just double click the run no docker dot bat file. And the idea is that this is supposed to be easier and for some people it wasn't working with docker. So for those people who couldn't get anything to work, now they can get something to work. So all I had to do was download that directory. Uh, I downloaded it from battlecode battlecode 18 dash scaffold. I only I only had to download that and double click, and now I'm already here. And it automatically opened the user interface, so I can play lecture player versus lecture player on one of these maps. And I can click run game. Now there's this new um, partly finished user uh, visualizer that shows Earth and Mars. And I wrote a little player, which you can see working around here. We've got the workers in, with Ws. We've got the factories with Fs. We've got the knights are being generated because, you know, apparently they're the worst unit in the game. And so that's, of course, the unit that I'm going to use. And they're, they're going toward one another, although they don't currently fight each other um, because, I, I, because I'm a pacifist. I, you know, I'm against violence, and I think violence only breeds more violence. So I hope you learned something from this example that you know, both teams can coexist, and, and that's really a lovely thing. I'm gonna push uh, end game. If you click stop manager, then, then it, kills this, uh, it kills the process that is actually running the matches, so then you have to restart it again. Okay, um, so just click this, the end game button. I'd like to give a little shout out to Anthony Bao, who uh, made this viewer, which is somewhat more usable than ours. Uh, there are others as well. You, you only have to go to anthonybow.com stroke bc18-tinyview. Probably most of you already know this from the Discord. How many already know this? Oh, not everybody. Great. So you can, you can use this guy's viewer, and if you click choose file and select the replay.bc18 in the bc18 scaffold, then you can see the match running. And the advantage of this over, uh, over the other viewer, here I'll hit pause, you can go forward and back in time. And if you go, so you see these red boxes with yellow outlines, those are workers, at least I assume so. And this uh, gray box that's sort of filling up, that's a factory, namely it's a blueprint for a factory. And then these workers are sort of hitting it with their hammers to build it up. And uh, then these boxes with the maroon outlines are knights. Look, I think this is a man after my own heart. He likes boxes. Max. Max. Uh, you are not showing your screen on Twitch. Oh my god. Oh my god. Thank you for the heads up. Uh, let's just double check that that's all set up. You guys can, people on Twitch can now see what I'm talking about. 
How embarrassing. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick overview of what I did. You download the, the scaffold from the GitHub site here, and then all you have to do is go into it and double click the run no docker dot bat file, and that opens up the UI here, and then when you run that, it gives you a substandard 2D viewer, and it also produces the match file, which we can watch in Anthony Bao's tiny viewer. Okay, you're brought up to speed. Somehow I managed to do it a lot faster that time. Okay, uh, I'm going to open the file again. I think it, it lost it for some reason. Okay, so it makes the, uh, the knights, and then I have it specified that at a certain round, they move toward the enemy. And they know where the enemy is because the map is symmetric. So they know their starting location, and they just back out from uh, where, where the enemy should be from that. Uh, and since I stopped the match at round 107 with exiting, then the, the replay file doesn't go all the way to round 750 when, um, when the kind and gentle powwow is unceremoniously terminated by the flooding you know, of, of planet Earth. So um, let's see, did I, did I cover everything I wanted to cover regarding Battlecode No Docker? I think so. So this is, the, uh, this is the information here in the Discord app under hashtag announcement. Is it a hashtag in this case, or does it consider it a pound sign? I never know. Is it, anybody have the answer to that? Okay, okay I'll just move on. Um, so this is a new push, and, uh, and it says here where to get it, and it says you can either do git pull or redownload it. This is the same thing we said already. Uh, it says, additionally, you'll need to update your run.sh files. So if you've got a player already that you made before we pushed the no docker capability, then it needs the new run.sh files. It, is that clear what we're talking about? So if I go here into battlecode 18-scaffold-no docker, and I open up the Python <laughs> example funks player, and I look at, say, the uh, run.sh file, and I do edit with notepad++, it says something here. And presumably that thing is different if I look in the old version of this, which was bc18 uh, dash scaffold dash master. So if we go here to Python and we look at this, so you can see here these are different. The new one says export Python path, yada, yada. The old one says echo test. So you need the new run.sh file. You can just copy your Python files over into, into the other ones. Um, so is it clear how to migrate your player into this new version of the Battlecode 18 scaffold? Uh, is it not clear? Good. Good. No answers. Uh, OK, so if, if everyone's just waiting for something exciting to happen, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to make that happen um, right away. So the next thing that I'd like to do in today's stunning and riveting lecture <laughs> is, to, um, is to show some of the examples from my, my Python lecture series on pathfinding. You saw a little sneak peek at them in the first lecture, but we're going to go into more, deep, more depth this time. And then I'm going to show a sort of fuzzy, basic pathing system that most of the time gets the job done. Uh, that's super simple. So I'll just open a command window, and then I'll move into the directory where I've got some of my things located. Documents, no, documents. L1, OK. py-3, example. I think 5.py, what's example 5 again? Oh, that's this, uh, that's this old game. I don't need that. Let's try example 6. I think example 6 is the first pathing example where we talk about bug pathing. Uh, so I can press the space bar to make the character follow his way to the destination. And bug pathing is fundamentally a state machine pathing system. Uh, if you press space bar again, we can go step by step with the N key. And with each press of the N key, the character chooses to move in the direction which brings him toward the destination, because he's in free mode right now. So he's just moving freely 
toward the destination. In battle code, you have the option of typing unit.location.map underscore location, open close parentheses, to get a unit's location, and then typing dot direction underscore two, and then giving that the argument of where it's going to, and so it'll specify where you want to go to. Once we hit an obstacle, however, we switch into a different state. Then we're no longer in the free pathing state, now we're in the follow pathing state. What we do is then we rotate to the right as many times as necessary until we see a free opening. So here, it wants to go down because it's following this diagonal staircase. It wants to go down, but it can't. So it rotates to the right, which moves it headed to the left. So in the next frame, it heads to the left. Okay, but now, every time it takes a move, it thinks, I'm following this wall with my hand, with my left hand on the wall. So since its left hand no longer sees a wall segment, it goes to that direction. And now it will continue to follow the wall around. At some point, it's closer to the destination than it was when it started. And then it enters into free pathing mode again. And it simply goes straight to the destination. Otherwise, it would just keep going around and around the obstacle. So how many people in the room think that this is a cool, you know, neatish way of doing things, but it won't work on all maps? I mean, who, you, it won't work on all maps? Uh, you mean like it won't ever find the destination, or it won't work well? I, I can think of an example where it won't ever find Okay, he can, can make where it won't ever find the destination. So he can think of an example where it won't ever. Let me try and make it such an example. Okay, I'm going to add, I'm going to do something that sort of looks like a lot of complexity here. Like, look at this. It's, uh, this is going to be really tough because this poor, no, this poor guy has to, here, I'm going to reset with I. He, he's going to head toward the destination, but there's all kinds of barriers, and it, it's actually the correct direction is to go in the reverse of where he's starting from. So let's press N a few times. Okay, he, he hit this wall, and he's going around it. And at some point over here, he just turned around again. Can anybody explain why he just turned around at this point? It's okay. There's only... Oh, one. What's up? Uh, right over here, it, he, he turned, he went here, and he, he went back on himself. And why is it? Because it's programmed to turn to the right after the line. Exactly, because he's programmed to turn to the right. So you're saying that oh, at this location, he'd begun following this wall instead of following this other wall. So he was following this wall, and now because he's gotten past it, or so he thought, he's now following the other wall. Is that what you, what you were saying? Yeah, and that's, that's correct. So this apparently random behavior of turning around um, is because he's, he's in a different state, he's following a different wall, and that means that, of course, as he follows this wall around, he's going to get to this location. And it's only when he gets to about here that he is closer to the destination than when he started, so he goes back into free mode, and he hits this object, and now he's going to be pathing around this wall. And what you'll see is that he actually ends up going all the way back around to the place he should have been to begin with. And then he gets to the destination. So this isn't an example in this particular case of a map that he can't get to, uh, to the destination. If you have like the source and then you have this wall and they sort of just look like place of the loop so that you would go in and go around this loop. Come up, come on up, draw the map. So you can draw the map with the left mouse key. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and reset with I and I'm going to clear the map with C. And you can go ahead and draw a map. So he turns to the right. Uh, you can, you can, uh, yeah, draw the map. You can use the right mouse button to erase walls if you accidentally place too many. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, and you can either press the space bar or the N key to watch it try to get there. Oh, we need to reinitialize with I. <laughs> Otherwise, he's following the old map. Okay, go ahead. Okay, he's following it around, and he follows around the edge of the map in this oh, case. Okay. He's got a trick there. Maybe you didn't realize. Yeah. So I consider the edge of the map to be another wall, and so you can follow around that as well. So you see that uh, it's tough to come up with a map that he won't find his way eventually to the goal. And you might be thinking, well, what's the point of this kind of thing? After all, we can see easily that there's 10 different ways to path to the goal better than this, and this isn't the fastest path. Well, I'll, I'll submit to you that at each moment in time, this character is only considering the tiles immediately adjacent to it. So from a computation standpoint, you could say it may be very low power for him to do so. 
because he's only got to check a few locations and compare and see if they're available. But I submit to you that I haven't drawn this character moving along the path for a reason. I didn't draw him moving along. There's a white square where he's planning to move. In fact, if you consider this whole path to be the plan for what he's going to do, then you can see that he might make an improvement or refinement on the path before actually setting out and moving ahead. So I'm going to press the R key to which I've bound a command which, uh, which will refine the path. Okay, I press R. Look at that. Already, the path is substantially improved. What the heck just happened? Well, you can see that this first loop here that he made has been eliminated because, after all, any time your path reaches the same point again, there's no point in doing that. that. That doesn't get you there faster. So we can cut out any instances such as this loop or such as this down and back period. We can cut out any instances where a, a loop is where the same tile is reached. So you just take, you, you search through the list and any time you find an element which is the same as an element you've already seen, you just take the whole lump and you chuck it out. And in Python, that's super easy. You can delete elements out of a list and the list just shrink, shrinks back up. Um, I wonder if there are any food or beverage containers that do the same thing. I feel like they typically require you to take the food out of the top and then they don't change in size. The, f the closest thing I can come up with is like a push pop. That, that has nothing to do with it. Okay, so then the next refinement you can apply to this path is you can turn more soon. And what that means in this case is you see this right turn here? Well, instead of turning right at that tile, he tried turning a little earlier, and that actually reduced the length of the path. It meant that you were able to save this tile of motion and that tile of motion. And if I continue to press the R key, then it tightens up the path to the point where it's as short as it can be, and subsequent presses of the R key only iterate between identical paths, paths of identical length on an orthogonal grid. That's pretty cool. Does that system work on all possible maps? Well, maybe by now, by the theory of questions, you can already guess the answer. Let's reset, path again. Oh, that was even too easy. Well, let's go ahead and allow it to go the far distance. Maybe we'll put a secret path up in the corner. No, I don't like the secret path. Oh, okay, we found something, but okay, let's, let's, re let's put it over here. Okay, I like this map. We'll let it finish, and then we'll see if we can refine the path. Interestingly, you could say that the fastest path is to reach the destination via this little shortcut here, but if you refine the path, you see that the refined path doesn't follow the shortcut to the right. After all, the refinement is only capable of eliminating obvious errors in the path. It's not capable of, ex of accessing the globally shortest route. So after all, what that means is that bug pathing is definitely a way which is guaranteed. Oh yeah, I've shown you two examples and now I'm making it into a proof. That's probably called like an onsatz or something in math. I don't know. But the point is, I, I'm saying that a bug pathing algorithm, correctly written, will always reach the destination, though it may not do so by the fastest path, even after a path refinement. So what can we do to try to get to the correct path? Well, you're, you've all been thinking about it the entire time. You've been saying uh, in, in your own heads to be polite, rather than at me, which would be less polite, that this is the stupidest way to get from place to place. And the correct way is to type py-3example7.py and to assess pathing using breadth-first search or something like that. So this is a breadth-first search pathing algorithm. It looks exactly the same. I'll put the, the barrier in the way, and every time I press the N key, a series of arrows will propagate outward from the white points. So when we reinitialize, the white point begins at the player, and each time I press the N key, arrows propagate outward. That is to say, I have a for loop that checks for each of the white tiles. What are the adjacent tiles? If those adjacent tiles, say I'm starting here, I check up. If up has, no, um, has nothing written in there, then I can write an arrow to it. Although because of the ordering of these arrows, this arrow here is going to evaluate first and will try to place a right arrow in that, in that tile. So it places a right arrow. And you keep going until the destination is reached. And at that point, you follow the arrows backward to the source. So you see the blue path is now following the arrows backward. And of course, I can demonstrate that this will work even on different looking maps. Let's go ahead and let it fill. I love to watch it fill the area. And in fact, the way this thing is written, I can, I can change the map even while it's running and, uh, and see which path is, end up, is going to end up being found. What if we have two paths of equivalent length? 
Okay, so that was the quickest in that case. And let me make that path a little bit longer. Maybe I will, how can I make that longer? Go like that. Okay, like so. Isn't it possible that there are two paths of equivalent length? Yes, it is possible, but there will only be one arrow drawn on this tile. And so it can only go back to the destination via one route. That's because on each tile we've chosen only to store one arrow, although you can conceive of a tile, such as this one right here, that can be accessed either by moving to the right from here or up from here, and that those are equivalent lengths, and our choice of which arrow to put there is somewhat arbitrary. It just comes from which one was evaluated first. And so you might choose to implement a refinement, as I have done in example 8.py. What a lead-in! That segue blew me over. Okay, so if we press spacebar, in this case, we see the propagating wave of arrows being written to the tiles, but instead of actually bothering to render the arrows, which would have been difficult because you're going to render more than one arrow to a tile, I just went ahead and left the, left the tiles blank, but rest assured that each of these tiles stores information about what arrows are on it. And so when we reach the end of the map and the arrows start propagating backwards, white tiles begin and spread in all available directions of arrows. That means that we get an estimate of all of the possible paths that have equivalent length, shown by these boxes. Furthermore, resetting, we get an estimate of the width of the path. For example, if you look from this tile, each time I press the N key, the number of white boxes on the screen indicates the width of the path, the number of equivalent paths that could be taken to the destination. So here the width is 6, and I could write the number 6 into information on each tile. That I've got a path width, width of 7 here, and then it narrows to about 1, and then goes back out to 2, and then 1 again. So I could say, if I find a path from my character to the destination, but it has a very narrow choke point, maybe that path isn't worth taking, at least from a military standpoint, because maybe my units will funnel through there and then get destroyed on the other side by some overpowered ranged units uh, holding that choke point. At the same time, you can see this path has the limitation, uh, this pathing algorithm has the limitation, that it considers this a choke point. It's not a choke point. If you're willing to go a little farther in the path, then you can access this space here on the left. So that means that this algorithm is really not telling you about the path width so much as it is the width of equivalent length paths. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got one last example on pathfinding before we move to an actual battle code example, and that's this one here. We start by outlining a border around the entire map and coloring it blue. Then any subsequent obstacles we place and press I will get their own colors. Pressing the N key expands a boundary outward from every direction, and I'm going to tell you why we're doing this in a second. Okay, so once we press the N key until the whole map is filled with color, what we end up seeing, and I hope you can see it, is a nodal network. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, look at this point here. It's at the intersection of three lines where I'm describing the intersection of two colors as being a line. So there's a line here between blue and green, and a line here between red and green, and so on. So this here is, I can consider, a node with three connections, three edges coming out of it. So we've got a node here, 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 and here. And then we've got paths between the nodes. And if we look again at the map, we can see that those nodes represent sort of intersection points of natural hallways formed by the obstacles on the map. So if we were to tell our robots, say we had a large swarm of robots, to follow the line that you see here, well, they could do so without hitting any obstacles, and they would be following in the very middle of the hallway. So if they're clumped up, let me draw, let me draw and paint what tends to happen. You've probably seen this in all kinds of strategy games and such. You see like an obstacle here, and maybe it's, it's really big, so you can't go around the bottom of it. So you've got your blob of guys, and they're headed to the right. And you tell them, I want you to go here. And so what they do is they sort of hunch up on here, and then they end up spreading out, and then they congo line from the end. Uh, you know, going, going around here. Maybe, you know, maybe they spread out a little bit, but because they're hugging this corner so hard, they end up Congo lining, and then, the, uh, and then the enemy, if they form a concave, can totally destroy them, like so. So, in my version of this, what's going to happen is a little bit different. You're going to tell them, yeah, I want you to get to the right, 
but I want you to go there via one of these hallways that we've identified with our nodal network. So then identifying hallways on this map, I'll just do it manually, looks sort of like this. So I've just sort of manually thought about expanding some kind of boundary from the outside. And in fact, with this map, the nodal network wouldn't work because, uh, because of a reason that I'll describe in a minute. Let's assume that the map is extended over here so that this piece here has a different obstacle ID than the surrounding outside. And then the nodal network is complete, like so. Okay, so say I tell my robots to go along the, the hallway, well then, in theory, if they're really following this edge, rather than this edge here on the side, then they should move as a distinct blob and be in slightly better configuration to face a concave of enemy units. So here we see this way of predetermining information about the map. I want you to think of this not as a particular algorithm, finding these hallways, but as a technique where you can start by taking the map, which is known ahead of time in Battlecode 2018, and doing some kind of processing on it to try to make subsequent pathfinding more efficient or more effective. So in this, in this case, we've found hallways, and they also tell us the width of the hallway. In this case, because there are two arrows on either side of the line, I can record a two on either side, and that tells me that the hallway is four tiles wide. And over here, I can write down that the hallway is two tiles wide. That way, if I have a heuristic for getting from place to place, say I want to get from this node to this node, I may choose to take this path rather than this other path because of reasons of its width as well as its length. Another kind of refinement which you can apply is to change the resolution of the map. If you have too many tiles, some pathing algorithms will be slow. However, in many cases, there are wide open spaces and you can coarsen them into a, a sort of meta map which contains fewer tiles or fewer nodes and makes pathfinding easier to do. So you can consider these kinds of improvements that can make your pathfinding more efficient or more effective. In the next section of the lecture, we'll go into one of the battle code players that I wrote. It's, a, it's in fact the first one that I wrote. I was sort of holding off on doing so, in part because I'm a lazy bum, but in part because it was a little bit difficult to see what the robots were doing. But now we've got visualizers, we've got the ability to run without a Docker toolbox, so we can talk about how this code runs that I wrote here. And it has a little pathing algorithm that somebody wrote for Battlecode years ago and that I've picked up and I use all the time. Let me show it to you. Okay, I have a basic method here. And this is for Battlecode now, so all the text that you see applies to the Battlecode game engine in Python. And, uh, and so you can copy and paste the code that I supply here and it will actually work, whereas the stuff that I supplied before is just for Python in general and has totally different data structures. So let's look at this method go to. It's so simple. It sets the d equals unit dot location dot map location dot direction to the destination. And if you can move, then move in that direction. Okay, that's the simplest way to get somewhere. But what ends up happening so often, and maybe you already have seen all of this, maybe this is already something you've done. I'm certain this part you've done before. So there's a guy, and there's another guy, and there's another guy, and uh, and this maybe there's a um, maybe the destination is here. Maybe these are workers. So I'll put like a W in one of them, and this is a factory down here, and you want these workers to get to the factory so they can build it. And what tends to happen sometimes is that this guy wants to go to the factory to build it, but there's another guy in his way. I mean, it would be fine if he would just make his way around like this. Look at this. The quality is just astonishing here. Look at this. Look at this quality. So he needs to be able to make his way around simple obstacles. Like this isn't a hard pathing problem. And in fact, there's a simple solution that'll get him there, which I call fuzzy go to. We specify a direction toward the, di the, uh, the place where we want to go. And so here, I'll just, in another astonishingly brilliant move of, uh, of presentational elegance, I'll, I'll have these two windows open at the same, t same time. Except, okay, so then let's say that we've got the direction toward. Say that we're this guy in the, in the we're this, this is us. So we tell him to go to the factory. He sets toward equals unit dot location dot map location dot direction to destination. So this is the toward arrow in, uh, in black. Then we check for a variety of different angles if he can go there. So instead of just trying to go straight, he tries a couple of tilt angles. Now, if you're really a beginner, you might be like, okay, well, if I'm going east 
then I'm willing to try northeast and southeast. And if I'm going southeast, I'm willing to try east and south. And, and, and you have to do all these ifs and thens. And I'm pretty sure I did that when I started. But there's an easier way to do it. I first start by initializing a list of all of the eight non-trivial map directions. So you see here, directions equals open square bracket bc.direction.north and so on until we get to bc.direction.northwest. And if you ask me, well, why did I do that instead of just saying what's available in the example funks player, which just gets something like bc.directions, it gets a complete list of all directions. There's two reasons. One is that the bc.directions list contains direction.center. That's the direction that gets returned if you ask for the direction to a tile which is on yourself. It gives you the center, I think. And, uh, and that one's not such a helpful direction to move in. The other reason is I want all of my directions to be clockwise ordered, and I'm not sure that they are in the, uh, in the game API. So I've generated a clockwise ordered direction list. Then I generate a list of numbers called try rotate 0, minus 1, 1, minus 2, and 2. And that's meant to be a priority list of which directions are, are willing to try. So I'm willing to try first moving in the direction specified, then moving in a direction slightly rotated left, slightly rotated right, twice rotated left, or twice rotated right. Those are the list of my priorities. So then, under fuzzy go to, I can check for tilt in try rotate. So this is an integer number describing the tilt angle associated with that direction. I'll rotate the angle, the, the direction toward, in the direction tilt. So the rotate function simply finds the index associated with the element dir in the list directions. So if my direction, as in this case, is southeast, then the index associated with southeast is, is 0, 1, 2, 3. It's 3. So then if I try rotate that by 0, it still ends up being index number 3, and you can't go that way. So then the next one it'll try. See, it says if it can move, then move and break, so get out of that loop. If it can't move, it'll keep going, so then it'll try. Try rotate at minus 1. So if you're going to rotate that by minus 1, then it brings you to index 2. So that's 0, 1, 2. It'll try east. So here's the, the first try rotate. And it can get there. So then it'll go there. And it'll keep doing that until it gets to the factory. It's a simple obstacle to get around, and so it finds its way there without too much trouble. So there you go, that's fuzzy go to. And now I'll present one more uh, way of getting from place to place that doesn't use an advanced pathing algorithm. This is a way that, I've, that I set up. I, I feel like I was the first one to come up with it, but it's computer science. And everybody's been there before, I'm sure, especially if we're talking about me. So let's, um, let's generate an obstacle that is concave re with respect to the guy that we're trying to control. This one, I've only got, I've only got Microsoft Paint. I haven't got uh, anything else for this obstacle. But, um, but I think you might like what I show you. So let's say we use the fuzzy go to method. I'm going to select this guy and I'm going to use, uh, yeah, it's transparent. Okay. So he's going to head towards the, the red thing. And then when he hits an obstacle, he's going to try directions that are fuzzy, that are around the direction he wants to go. So he'll end up sliding along. But then at some point, he gets here. And, uh, and he's willing to try going this way or that way. So he, he bobbles around. He goes here, but then he finds that the direction toward where he wants to go is um, then if, if he manages to get so far to the right, I think in this case he might make it because he's always going to try going one way over the other way, but he might end up getting to the point where he gets so far along here, let me scoot this in a little bit, that now the direction toward the obstacle is, a, is this diagonal. And what you sometimes see is that he ends up bobbling along side to side trying to get to the obstacle in question. And in fact, I don't have to convince you that they bobble along. I think this guy right here bobbles along. Let me, let me go back. Uh, let's, see if he, let's see if he bobbles. He's not bobbling. He's not showing it at all. One of these guys at some point, oh, that, you see that guy? You see that guy right there? Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't wrong. See that guy? Uh, I'm pointing with my finger on the screen as if you can see it. So this guy here, you see him bobbling left to right? You see that? Okay, wait, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm asking you if you can see it, but I won't be able to tell if you've said that you can see it. So one of you can nod. I saw a nod. Okay, great, thank you. So that guy's bobbling, and the reason he's bobbling is what I said before, is that his, he gets so far that the direction toward the object changes, and so he keeps trying to decide where to go. And you're probably thinking, oh, this is a great thing. Uh, I already know how to use bug padding, so I'll just use that instead. And you're probably right. That would be a much better solution than what I'm about to propose, which is 
what I call the stinky trail method. I just made that up this very instant. I don't know if you, if you could tell. So what it is, is as the character moves along, he leaves behind a stinky trail. So he goes like this. Ew, it's stinky. And then he, he keeps going along. So when he gets to here, I'm gonna paint, uh, I'm gonna paint in a stinky trail. Ew, gross. And, uh, and what he does when he considers where to path is he says, I'm willing to go anywhere that's an open tile, but not any stinky tiles. You see, what is a stinky tile? It's just made up. He makes, we, we store a list of where he's been. And I guess in this version of Battle Code, you'd have to store a little separate list for every robot. Or would you? More on that later. So he's got a stinky path, and maybe the stinky path has a limited length. So maybe at some point he forgets that that part was stinky. Like uh, somebody turned on the fan in the bathroom and it stopped smelling bad after a while. <laughs> so so he, that part stinks. So even though he gets to here and he wants to bobble back into that region, he considers that region taken. He considers it taken, right? So if he, he thinks he wants to go that way and he's willing to go here or here. But now because both of those ways are blocked, this way by the stink path, then he has a question to go here or here. And so as long as he doesn't make the stupid decision of going here, it's going to be fine. And the choice of whether he makes the stupid decision or the, or the lucky decision, this one, depends almost entirely on your choice of the ordering. So you see this ordering here of the tri-rotate, 0, minus 1, 1, minus 2, plus 2. That's not a random choice of ordering. That tends to produce the occasion where he goes the right way. And then he'll slip around this boundary and he won't get stuck. And what was the penalty associated with implementing this? He had to store a list of five things. In some cases, you can get by with storing a list of one thing. Amazing. Just amazing. Ter terribly amazing. Okay, so another advantage of this year's pathing is that you've got multiple dudes, right? Uh, and they're all controlled by the same guy. In the past, if you wanted the, your little robots to store information about with, which paths were stinky, they couldn't do it very easily. They couldn't do it because they would have to send all that information to another robot, and they'd have to collate and collect information from all the robots together and then send all that out again and all the overhead and computation and effort associated with doing that I think made it unlikely for players to actually bother. This year however because all that information can be stored in one list if you've got a guy and he's here and you want him to path to a destination here you can have him move along and if he's got that old method even with the stinky path he's going to bobble around in this corner quite a bit because he's always, when he gets to here, he'd rather head this way because it's closer to the destination. Here, he'd rather head this way, so he's gonna bobble around a whole bunch. However, if each time he's bobbling around, he's building up more and more of a sort of stinky feeling in this corner, then at some point, you're gonna get to the, and, and all the robots can be doing this together, because you'll find that in, especially newbie co code like mine, you'll get a whole army bobbling around in a corner, but at some point, it'll get so stinky in there that the next robot that comes and sees this will just turn this way and go through. He'll see the stink wall and he'll think, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. And he'll just go around and get to the destination with no problem at all. So I'll just go through a couple of the little things that I did in, um, in this little example player, which will be made available to you uh, in case you want to get started. Because it, after all, it does a couple of useful things. And, uh, and it does demonstrate important things about ethics, like not harming your neighbor. Uh, so, so, uh, so what I did here, okay, maybe you've already seen everything that's in this file, but maybe there's one thing in it. There's a chance that there's one thing in it that you haven't seen that I've done here that you could use. And so that's why I'm going to tell you about it. And then right afterward, we'll, uh, we'll take questions and then go get food. So let's look at this right here. I made these little functions at the beginning that help me for pathing. And here's the part where I invert the location of my starting location to find the enemy. If you didn't think about doing this, it's because you didn't get explicitly information about where the enemy starts, but you know where you start and you know how big the map is. So here, I check if the planet is planet Earth. After all, that's the only one that's symmetric by reflection. And then I make one location equals gc.myunits at zero dot location dot map location. So I'm just taking the zeroth unit that I start with. After all, I'm guaranteed to start with at least one worker. You could go through all of them and say, okay, if I've got workers here, 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 they've got enemies there, there, there. I've only just done it for one, but you can extend it yourself. I specify that earth map equals gc.starting underscore map bc.planet earth. Okay, so I get that map and I'm told 
that every time you call GC dot starting map or, or get every time you get a large object from GC, it's making a new instance of it. So if you're trying to path around, this is something that isn't said. I don't think it's necessarily written anywhere in the API, but this is super important for saving time in your pathing algorithms. You only want to get the map once and just store a local copy like I've done. I've stored it into the variable earth map. Because if I keep calling gc.startingmap bc.planetearth and then I start doing dot is location available and that kind of stuff on that, then every time I call that, it's going to have to make a whole new version of it. And then your code is going to have to pay for that in time. Hope that's clear. So you go ahead and cache a version of that on your code. And then you can invert that location to know where the enemy is. And the inversion is simply up here. New x equals earth earthmap.width minus loc.x. New map.height minus loc.y. And then we make a new map location. We make, I, this blew my mind when I was doing battle code in Java for the first time. I thought a map location was something magical that just sort of came from the heavens and it couldn't be made by human hands. But in this case, it's actually true that you can instantiate new objects in the battle code uh, game engine. And so you can instantiate a new map location simply by typing b.map location, bc.planet. You specify the planet and the x and the y coordinates. Now you've got a new map location, which you can use in all of the functions which are available in the engine. Uh, maybe 90% maybe of you did not, were not surprised at instantiating objects in, a, in, a, in an API and in a package that we're given access to. But to me, it was a, a big deal. And probably there's one person out there who's also surprised. I have a question. Wait, is it, is it always going to be that symmetry because the other possible symmetries? There, are, there it could be reflection uh, that, that wouldn't be this symmetry. You're absolutely right. I just did it this way uh, for convenience. That's a good point. So maybe you make a list of all possible symmetries. After all, there aren't many. There's, there's only really. You say four. There's, there's rotation 180 degrees. There's mirror x and mirror y. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, mirroring x and y a is a 180 degree rota rotation. So I think there are three possible locations of enemies. But the developers of this game are so lazy. I mean, consistent. That, uh, that they'll, I think, at least in previous years, they've used the same symmetry on just about every map, just because that was the symmetry that was implemented first in the map editor. Um, uh, but by th now that I've said that, I'm sure somebody's going to prove me wrong. So let's go through the, less, the rest of this guy uh, just a little bit, and then, we will, uh, and then we'll go get some food. So the first thing that I do at the beginning is I count things. For me, I don't want to just build a million workers. I want a certain number of them. So I iterate through my units, and if the unit type is worker, I increment num workers. And to me, this is like critical for strategy. I want to I wanna only make five workers or something like that, because after all, if you just let them go, then you, you end up with nothing but workers. Um, having, having this repeated sort of seems like a waste, but after all, I don't want any of my units to act until I know how many workers I've got. Another thing I've got here is I check to see if I've got a, a factory that isn't built yet. Because I don't like the idea that I've got workers who are like putting down all kinds of factories, but they haven't finished building the first one yet. So I have this thing here that checks if there is a, a unit, which is a factory, but it isn't built yet. Then it'll specify, it'll set the value of blueprint waiting to true. And later on, if there's a blueprint waiting, the worker goes ahead and says, I got to go there and fix that thing because you know I, I can't start a new project until I've done that one. So look at this. See these three guys over here? They were made when they were doing the replicate mode. So if I press N, uh, no, the right arrow key. I think the right arrow key. Well, maybe it, I, I need to select it. I think it, or D, is it D? There's something that moves to the next, the next turn, but it isn't working for me right now. Maybe if I, it is the right arrow, but for me, I'm pressing it, I swear. But they're in replicate mode, so that there ends up being three of them. And then at some point, as soon as the first factory is placed, they all join together like, like an Amish community building a house. It's very, it's very touching to see. And, and it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the big things that makes these communities of totally artificial beings uh, so cohesive and, uh, and, and fun to be in. OK, so, um, so there's that piece here, which I wanted to show. And then there's just this, uh, the code for, for building 
and for, for moving toward the enemy at a certain round. Uh, hard coding things like this, like if a round gets to this number, then go attack, in my opinion, is not such a terrible idea because after all, it's an easy way to make your code do something sudden all at once. And if all you're trying to do is test like combat micro, then you just want a way of producing 10 guys over here and 10 guys over here and getting them to attack at once. And then maybe later on you can put something more complicated for deciding when to engage in, in an attack and when not to. I'm excited about subsequent lectures where we can talk about combat and show cool videos and, and examples of the game actually working. I think this year's game is really great even though it's not perfectly balanced yet. In fact, I think that makes it even more fun. Are there any questions about the content which we covered in today's lecture? I don't hear any. If it's all right with you guys, then we'll go ahead and get food. But wait, don't get up. The, um, we can't eat it here, as I reminded you before. We have to eat it out in the, in the hallway. So thanks so much for coming. distribution of paths and that's if I'm if, if I'm thinking this through correctly it, it favors wider paths over narrower paths but also goes to narrower path paths in the uh, the electric field yeah yeah I think it does that might be useful that is that is useful it's like re self repelling yeah. that's a good point like like it, like it, yeah like it automatically see it like, favors like larger paths larger, wider paths Yeah, I'm not, I'm not not sure what the best way to implement that would be. I think I think it's something called the um, Hello, what's and up? I have a couple of questions. First of all, I cannot turn on visualization okay. without Docker. Uh, please uh, have a seat. Yeah. Um. going to upload something from the lecture uh, so that people can have access to the player and then and then I'll be right there Where the exam, you know the Python demos you're showing? Yeah, yeah. I find the code for that? Yeah, I've got them posted on my personal website okay. at maxmanindustries.com. And I've also got them available. Uh, I think there's a link to them on the, uh, the battlecode.org website. You can go to um, materials, and I think it may be there also hosted. It's in a file called l1-10.zip. Uh, yeah, I think it's there. Um, I can help you with it in a moment.
Hey, one second. Oh, maybe you can help them. Uh, they've oh. got they've got a question. Uh, sorry, I'm. Okay, I might not be the first person to answer your question, but like. Okay, guys, I got a, um, a download for you, if you're still there. Um, okay, gonna go to the dashboard, and I'll put this link in the Discord, too. Maxmanindustries.com stroke lecture player dot zip. Okay, so um, you have to go to the uninstall program and uh, I hope you don't mind uninstalling Python 32. Yeah. Yep. And what uh, and so the rest of the instructions are available on the uh, on the uh, here it says thirty two bit. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure that um, Yeah, I had the same problem on my computer, and um, so it's just it's just a question of <laughs> finding the right. Uh, please do, please do. Ah, okay. So here, here. Sorry, one. Uh, yeah. oh, just uh, finishing this. So here under GitHub. Yep. is instructions and it says here here's your error oh yeah, and yeah it says you need to uninstall this and then you run this it's, uh -huh. it's a long command but you're basically uninstalling a bunch of things which were installed in 32-bit mode yep and then when you rerun this it'll do them in 64 and i had the exact same problem and it'll work all right thank you yeah oh, okay I'll try. okay thanks for your patience Let me show you what I've what I've started with here, because I, it's like <laughs> there's yeah. so many different things. Yeah. Okay, so what I did here is I I definitely I think you'll definitely start with um, you'll make a map first yes. by doing yeah. Earth map equals GC dot starting underscore map BC dot planet Earth. This is exactly mm -hmm. the same as what, well, you could rename that, but of course this is the same. Mm -hmm. Then you just need to check for each tile, like you wanted to know if it's passable or something so like this. So how can I iterate through every location? Let me see if I can, maybe there isn't a way to do it, but let me, I mean, you know the width and height, right? Yep. There's earth map that width and there's earth map that height. Yes. So you yourself could, in the worst case, if there isn't an iteration it's method, you could do 4x in range width. 
um, earth map dot height, yeah, and, and then, then for y in range earth map I, yeah. dot uh, width or something. Then you could say uh, map location equals bc dot map location, bc dot planet dot earth. So you're making a new location, yeah. new x or, or or x y. Okay, and then you could do something like earth gotcha. yeah, planet. Just that you know is available map location yeah, or something like, like that. I don't know if that's if that's the. That's also that works. I don't know if that's exactly that the syntax works. or the best way or what, but that's a way that yeah, might work. Yeah. I was thinking about the pathfinding stuff. Yes. Yes, you were. And I cannot. It, that you you gave me the directions to the the, the example play, example like, player. I did. I think so. The sure sure looks like it. Oh, I might have. Sorry, sorry if I gave you the wrong ones. That's the lecture, the lecture player. Yeah, yeah, but open it. This is mine. Yeah, but it's just the no, the, you know, like how they had little like, screens and they played like, Pathfinder demos, like, example H and like. Oh, so you wanted that one? Yeah. Okay, so that one is is um. It's 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 maxmanindustries.com. Yeah. Sorry, I, I gave you the wrong one. Slash, because someone else was asking for it, so I got <laughs> I got a wire crossed in my head. So just sorry. So go slash um, L1. Let's go capital L1. Capital L1. Capital L1 dash one zero. Dot zip. Oh, thanks. I think that I think that should be it. Oh, it seems to be working. And the thing is, you need Pi Game in order to run it. I have Pi Game. Perfect. You are a step ahead of the game. Yeah, you can just power. You've got power. Oh, it's just, it's just. 